Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about one of the editor's primary tools, style guides. We're also going to talk about style sheets. So we will begin with describing the purpose of style guides, then exploring some examples of style guides, finally explaining principles for creating what's called a style sheet. Let's begin with the purpose of style guides. Let's define the concept of style first. Merriam-Webster includes several definitions for the noun style, but here's the most generic one, a distinctive manner of expression. Here are a few examples. The first has to do with written language, the second with human behavior or personality, and the third with fashion. Humans spend a considerable amount of time categorizing styles. Here's an example with women's boots categorized by personality. All 28 of these items are boots. Their essential substance is the same, but these four are distinctively dramatic. Style isn't the substance of something, it's how that substance is presented. Here's another fashion example, but this time categorized by formality level. All have the same basic substance, but this one is distinctively sloppy. I admit we don't all agree about styles. I've shown you an example here using Western men's clothing from a website of a men's stylist named Antonio Centeno. On his site, he says, like it or not, presentation matters. Scientist Edward Thorndike coined the psychological term the halo effect as a type of immediate judgment made on a person's appearance. People who are seen as more attractive are treated with more respect. While you might not want to accept Antonio's guidance about style, you should recognize that people, all of us, judge people and companies for that matter by the style in which they present themselves. That brings us to the style guide. Before we talk about specific style guides, I should briefly define what a style guide is. It's a standard something established as a model. There are a host of organizations that develop standards for everything from quality management, remember ISO, to electrical engineering, to accounting. And yes, there are many organizations that develop standards for the style of content as well. In an e-zine called Impact, Liz Moorhead made this point. A thorough brand style guide has two equally important parts, visual or design and content. A visual style guide shows how all the content should be designed while a content style guide controls how the copy and text within the design is presented. Here's a list of the types of visual or design elements that a style guide might standardize. Here's a list of the content elements that might be standardized. Changing the visual or content style would alter how content is judged. Now let's look at some specific style guides. Your assigned reading for this module asks that you view UNT's identity guide, which says, I quote, to ensure our communications portray a consistent image of UNT, the university has adopted standards to guide both the visual and narrative expression of our brand. Through consistent use of these guidelines, UNT will achieve greater recognition in the marketplace. Although narrative guidelines are included, they are definitely limited, for example, to prescribed ways of referring to the name of the university or where to check facts. The bulk of UNT's identity guide addresses visual presentation, how to use logos, marks, colors, photography, for both print and the web. For instance, UNT Green Online must be hex number 00853E. Use of fonts is described. We use Adobe Jensen and Centaur, and they say it's to represent the formal and collegial aspect of UNT. The bottom line here, they do this to influence the way UNT is judged by the audience of those communications. When we talk about what is standardized by a style guide, we might also be talking about the written style of content. Your assigned reading for this module asks that you view several examples of content style guides that I'll be talking about a little later in the lecture. 
Right now, I'm showing another one from the U.S. federal government's 18F group, which manages web content. They developed a guide for the way its employees present its communications. 18F does this to influence the way it's judged by the audience of those communications and also to influence the multitude of writers who create content. That brings us to the second topic in this lecture. We're going to take a look at a selection of six content style guides. Contrary to what some might assume, the standards that appear in a style guide were not handed down from the gods. This quote from the Chicago Manual of Style, or CMOS, makes that clear. Style guides are established by the people involved in creating, producing, and distributing content. That has important implications that will become more clear as I talk about a few specific guides. When I mention style guides, I'm guessing some people think back to the writing style guides required by their English teachers. The MLA Handbook is produced by a professional organization for language teachers, and it's used in academic contexts by students and by some publishers of academic content, like research journals, for those language teachers. Because these are typically the first style guides people hear about, many assume they contain all of the quote-unquote correct rules for writing in English. In fact, guides like the MLA have a fairly narrow audience, all of whom are writing about non-technical content. All editors must understand that a style guide is just that, a guide for the standard style for communicating within a specific rhetorical context. Guides other than MLA present styles for communicating in other contexts. Let me be as clear as possible. There is no single correct style. What is a standard for one audience and purpose is not going to be standard for a different audience and purpose. Wearing formal clothing to a job interview is standard style, but wearing the same clothes to go bowling is not. Probably the most comprehensive style guide in the U.S., the Chicago Manual of Style goes back to 1891, when the University of Chicago Press opened. Now it's in its 17th edition. CMOS has more than a thousand pages in print, or more than 2,000 hyperlinked paragraphs online. It's become the authoritative reference work for authors, editors, proofreaders, indexers, copywriters, designers, and publishers. But CMOS has little to do with creating a distinctive brand nor is it targeted to technical information, but it is almost universally used for traditional publishing of books in the U.S. That's why I place this style guide on the list for your assigned reading in the module. But CMOS does not set out the exact standards found in, for example, the AP Style Book, which is the Bible for journalists, and it's updated yearly. Style guides are living documents that are updated regularly. Like CMOS, AP Style is for traditional publishers, not specific to an organization, so it doesn't attempt to establish a brand. AP Style focuses on, of course, saving space. Because much of the content on the web is written by public relations professionals, much of the writing follows AP Style. Here's a specific and simple example of how style guides might differ that I borrowed from an e-zine called Word Counter. CMOS and AP have slightly different standards for using a serial comma. In CMOS, it's always used. So both example 1 and example 2 include a comma before AND. In AP, a serial comma is not used in simple series. So example 2 is the same as in CMOS, but example 1 has no comma before the AND. All editors need to know what serial commas are, but they have to know which style guide is relevant in order to know whether a serial comma is required in any specific instance. The point I want to make here is there's no single rule for a great many things. That means editors should not try, even if it were possible, to identify the rule and memorize it. Instead, they must first know which style guide applies to the material they're editing, and second, they must know where and how to locate the standards in that style guide. You may be surprised to know that Microsoft publishes a writing style guide, but they've produced one for more than 20 years. The current version is online only, but there were four prior print editions. IBM also publishes a style guide. 
Of those I've discussed so far, these are the most directly relevant to TechCom. They both also attempt to create and maintain the brand of their organization. Here are a few more examples of how style guides might differ. First, both CMOS and Microsoft's guide, MWSG, allow authors to use well-known acronyms or other abbreviations without spelling them out the first time in certain cases where the acronym is considered equivalent to a word. But CMOS refers to Webster's Dictionary and MWSG refers to American Heritage Dictionary to determine which acronyms are on that list. By the way, any complete style guide will state what source they reference for standards like spelling, because not all dictionaries are the same either. In another comparison, CMOS includes an entire chapter on the use of quotations and dialogue, whereas MWSG includes just a few words about the use of pull quotes the stylized text used as a type of visual to pull readers into the content. On the other hand, MWSG includes an entire section on standards for writing for chatbots. A search of CMOS finds no relevant content there. Editors must, again, know which style guide applies to the material they're editing. If you're working on fiction, CMOS will include all the essential standards for your edits. If you're working on a chatbot, however, it will be mostly worthless because it doesn't address the standards relevant to your material. I want to mention MailChimp style guide. I asked you to view theirs because it's often held up as an exemplar in the world of web content and UX writing. It was tremendously successful in establishing a distinctive brand. They published the first version on GitHub in 2015, made it available to others under a Creative Commons license, and many web content developers have adapted it for their own use. When asked why MailChimp developed their own style guide, Aaron Cruz said, it's more of a resource for people at the company who are in other disciplines and find themselves writing content for MailChimp in some capacity. We don't staff every single cross-functional team with a content strategist. This should sound familiar to you after reading the article I assigned for this module. Style guides are the primary tool for building consistency in the content produced by non-traditional publishers. In other words, organizations like MailChimp and Microsoft and IBM. The author of your assigned reading for this module, Esha Adya, reported an investigation into style guides at five different software firms. Adya made it clear that for non-traditional publishers, the most important reason for having a style guide is to create a distinct and unified presence for the company's brand. Think back to the story I told about Precore, the company creating premium fitness equipment in the lecture on editing as a type of QA. Adia says, style guides will have a successful impact when they reflect consensus in the organization, are integrated into day-to-day -day operations, and are revised periodically. The final style guide I want to mention is truly a standard. Before the 1980s, everyone in the world had to read and understand English to maintain aircraft. ASD STE 100 was developed in Europe to improve readability of manuals for non-native English speakers, and it also aided translation of those materials, which was time-consuming and expensive and resulted in some life-threatening mistakes. It's now used in many regulated industries, including all U.S. defense contractors. STE, or Standard Technical English, is a controlled language. It consists of a dictionary of about 900 allowed words and a set of 65 writing rules. Tom Johnson, on his I'd Rather Be Writing blog, provided a helpful summary of STE. He gives this example of controlled vocabulary. When words have synonyms, STE prefers the simplest word. For example, instead of allowing writers to choose among, begin, commence, initiate, originate, or other synonyms, STE adopts the most unequivocal and simple verb, start. Controlled vocabulary lowers translation costs because translating a single word is cheaper than translating four words. STE writing rules are more difficult to explain quickly. The example I'm showing you here shows one longer declarative sentence with subordinate clauses is edited to three short sentences. 
and the first is an imperative to make clear that the sentence is a warning to the reader. If you're feeling overwhelmed by the six style guides I've mentioned, I can only warn you there are many, many more. I repeat, editors must first know which style guide applies to the material they're editing. Most editors limit the type of material they edit because it's impossible to be an expert in more than a few of them. Let me move on to the final topic in this lecture, style sheets. This will be helpful in completing the comprehensive edit project because you're required to submit a style sheet along with your edited material. That's because it'll be difficult to do a good job with a comprehensive edit without one. You may be wondering why I'm introducing style sheets when there are multitudes of style guides you can use. It's simple. Style sheets are concise and specific, whereas style guides are comprehensive and general, even when they're for a single organization. When editing specific material, you need to save time by listing all of the standards you keep looking up in one place. That list is usually called a style sheet instead of a style guide. I've included several sample style sheets on Canvas where your comprehensive edit assignment appears. You want the size of your style guide to be just right. So let's talk about how to create one. First, the editor should always include the working title of the material being edited and the author or commissioning body. The style sheet should include the editor's name and contact info as well as date so everyone who might see the style sheet in the future knows who it was created by and when. Your list should also include the references that guide all of the editorial decisions not covered in your style sheet. That means an existing style guide, a dictionary, perhaps a grammar usage guide, etc. It's imperative to say which edition because usage changes over time, so do these references. The third item is a word list. No matter what type of material, there will be words that are used in a specific way or a special way. For example, an editor at a software firm might need to note that APP, app, not application or program, is used to describe desktop software. The fourth item, always included, is a list of definitive spelling and punctuation choices when the style guide offers options. For instance, an editor of a research paper going into a British journal might need to note that British spelling is used. The fifth item occurs often, especially in technical content. The editor notes on the style sheet that metric measurements, for example, are used, or how telephone numbers should appear. Some style sheets might also include some formatting choices, like use sentence-style capitalization in headings. On her blog, editor Eva Chung documented all of the individuals within the book publishing process who might need a copy of the style sheet in order to do their jobs effectively and efficiently. Let me quote a little bit from her here. I always include a copy of the style sheet when I send an edited manuscript to an author because I feel it's foundational to good author relations. Not all authors will look at them, but those that do read them carefully. Second person. You, the copy editor, you need a copy for when the author returns the copy edited manuscript. You'll have to refer to and update the style sheet, so why not make it easier for yourself? Third, the proofreader undoubtedly will use your style sheet the most. Fourth, the indexer. Eva's an indexer, and she says, I rarely import the style sheet directly into an index, but I do use it to double check the spelling of my entries and confirm the style for the wording of headnotes and subentries. And then finally, fifth, she says any member of the editorial team that may have to work on a new edition of the material. So let me summarize. I began this lecture by defining the concept of style. Style is not the substance, it's how that substance is presented. Changing the visual or content style of substance alters how it's judged. To manage those judgments, Organizations develop style standards, collect them in a style guide, use them as a reference for publishing content. While style guides are important tools for writers, they're especially critical for editors. Second, I briefly explored six specific style guides, noting that the reason we can't all use the same style guide 
is that standard style must be applied within a specific rhetorical context. What works for a high school student in an English class is not what works for a newspaper publisher or a defense contractor. As your assigned reading stated about technical content, style guides have a successful impact when they reflect consensus in the organization, are integrated into day-to-day -day operations, and are revised periodically. Finally, I explained that editors create style sheets for a specific editing job as a tool for listing all the choices the editor had to make while editing that specific material. I provided you with examples of typical items that appear in the list and mentioned the different individuals who benefit from having a copy of the editor's style sheet during the publishing process. I'll end this lecture by repeating that you're going to create your own style sheet when you do the comprehensive edit project. There are samples for you to look at on Canvas where that assignment is described. And as an editor, style guides are going to be your primary tool for doing your copy editing.